Hi again, this is DeSalami, and welcome to episode 13 of 90s Overlooked Underhood. So, big cheat, I'm afraid, but I'm going to have to get out there and get this up front straight away. Today's album was released in 2011. Yeah. But if you recall from previous videos, I have talked about um, shoegaze bands in the past and how a lot of their best material, I feel, was released via their EPs rather than the LPs that many of the leading bands of the scene did. And um, this is one of those examples where a band that kind of didn't exactly come out of the shoegaze scene, but but were definitely shoegaze adjacent um released a string of eps which were extraordinary and which were out of print for a number of years which were finally released um as a single compilation album in 2011. so please excuse me these are records from the exact period we're looking at um but they happen to have been compiled on an album which was released many years later Anyway, without further ado, today I'm talking about Disco Inferno and the five EPs, their compilation released in 2011. So, yes, um, these EPs were all released between 1992 and 1994. So I've placed them kind of in the middle of that in the chronology, just for completeness sake. Um, and again, as I said, I think like a lot of the shoegaze bands, these EPs probably constitute the absolute pinnacle of what Disco Inferno ultimately achieved uh, in the recordings. Although I will also add that the album they released during the same period called D.I. Goes Pop, that runs it very close. It's a very fine album. Um, but with all these EPs compiled on one album, which is still readily available, um, it's too good an opportunity to miss out on this music, and I chose I, to review this one instead. So, Disco Inferno formed in 1989. Um, they were quite closely aligned with uh, another band um, of the period doing kind of similar stuff, although they did diverge considerably. Uh, that band would be Bark Psychosis, and in fact, an early member of uh, Disco Inferno was Daniel Gish, who did leave Disco Inferno to join Bark Psychosis. Um, their early sound, Disco Inferno's early sound, uh, you can firmly pin it right in the board over the bit that's marked post-punk cornerstones, and specifically the little section where Joy Division and New Order and Wire live. So they released um, an album and um, a few singles and EPs, but Ian Krauss, the singer and guitarist, um, had big ideas. Ian Krauss had been completely blown away by the kind of the sampling soundscape of uh, the public enemy records of the late 1980s and the early 90s. Uh, and the production squad, um, the bomb squad, as they were called in public enemy. And um, yeah, it made him question everything that Disco Inferno were doing. He felt they were very mired in the past and that they just needed to do something extraordinary. They needed to make a huge leap to just kind of take their music somewhere new. Uh, in terms of other influences, uh, Ian Krauss has, has admitted that he was uh, deeply also indebted to the Young Gods, also featured on an earlier episode of this series. And um, early on as well, by the very kind of... Um, very overt kind of political rap hip hop records of um, bands like Consolidated, who again were appropriating samples from all manner of places and incorporating them into the music to make something meaningful and political and very direct, um, fusing samples with words um, into something uh, kind of greater than the sum of the parts. The samples kind of informing the words um, 
and the words leading to ideas for new samples that you could use. Um, and all to kind of put out this quite heavily socio-political message, whether you did it in a confrontational, overtly political way, like consolidated or otherwise. Um, yeah, very, very forward thinking move, um, which uh, Ian Krauss just attacked with kind of quite some vigor. Uh, he literally, he literally just took his guitar apart, ripped out the original pickup and put in a MIDI pickup so that he could use it to play samples. He turned his guitar into a, into a sample trigger. And um, the rest of the band um, were kind of cajoled down this route, um, quite willingly, I think. So drummer Rob Waitley got a kind of MIDI, uh, an electronic drum kit with the pads. And uh, bassist Paul Wilmot initially stayed with kind of a traditional bass, kind of to anchor the sound, but also just because they were skint. They had no money. And um, they kind of set out on this mission to completely overhaul their sound. Kind of slightly stymied by the fact that they were learning as they went along. The technology was very new. It was also prone to kind of breakdown and uh, just all sorts of random events that they couldn't really control. So, um, yeah, they rather bravely just set out on this path, which kind of left them feeling a little vulnerable and a little adrift and a little kind of out of control of what they were doing. But they reveled in it. They they kind of took this as a as a way of creating something totally new. What they saw as something totally new anyway. And their response to these limitations and the way they responded to the way the samples informed what they were singing about and the way that kind of looped around back into the music um, really heavily affected their songwriting and gave them this immense sense of freedom. Uh, so some key tracks. I'll try and pick a track from each of the EPs uh, just to kind of give you a feel for their entire um, career during uh, this period, uh, 92 to 94. Summer's Last Sound was the lead track from the EP from October of 1992. Man, what a statement. Um, it begins with this kind of mournful New Order-ish kind of Joy Division-ish bass line with these kind of little little sampled birdsong motifs just repeating and looping in the background. Gradually they introduce some wave sounds and the bass line picks up, it becomes more urgent. There's more kind of chirping, more birdsong. These kind of layered keyboard sounds kind of settle in. You hear a tiny bit of like acoustic guitar or treated guitar strumming in the background. And then Ian Krauss comes in with his lyrics full of this disjointed kind of troubled, troubling imagery. He sings about girls flying in land as the summer's kind of over. The smell of corpses and mass graves. He sings about immigrants being kicked and mistreated and killed. He sings, um, well, he kind of speak, sings. Death always finds us in the end. It's burning shadow, always weeping over hot hamlets and plains. There's just this air of, he's talking about displaced people looking for safety and just finding just intolerance and hate and violence. It's extremely powerful, but it's just got this strange, soothing, gliding kind of dreamlike quality. Um, it is quite an extraordinary record. Um, for this to be their first release after their kind of reinvention. Um, as I said, quite a statement. Um, if it's got any precedent based on their kind of uh, acknowledged um, influences, you could kind of draw a line between it and Atrocity Exhibition by Joy Division, the, the opening track from Closer. It has a very similar kind of disturbing, disjointed, but kind of hypnotic, dreamlike feel. Um, yeah, very good. Um, a Rock to Cling To is the uh, lead track from the EP from July of 93. It starts with like this slightly distorted um, 
almost a traditional kind of guitar sound, certainly for Disco Inferno, this tumbling little kind of doleful, sad riff, just repeating. And then the samples start to kind of creep in. Um, you get breaking glass, kind of slightly disembodied voices, this kind of little kaleidoscopic kin keyboard kind of synthy riff. But it sounds almost like it could be an ice cream van, either speeded up or slowed down, or a music box. Um, and then you get these occasional like backing vocal, almost shrieks. Um, it's definitely a slightly more traditional sound that harks back to their first albums and EPs than they were kind of generally engaging in. But yeah, it really captures that same air that 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 Summer's Last Sound had. This mournful, desperate sense of, of world weariness, of these Im this imagery of being lost at sea, you know, looking for safety, looking for salvation, looking for something to hang on to. Um, yeah, it's very powerful music. So we've mentioned their kind of um, the debt they owe to kind of early New Order and Joy Division. And um, I think The Last Dance, um, the title track from the EP from November of 93, is the one that really shows this early New Order um, influence in their, in their music. It's very reminiscent of songs like something like Ceremony or even Dreams Never End from uh, the Movement album. It is more traditionally guitar focused. It's poppier and lighter sounding, but the lyrical concerns still, you know, they're still the same, still quite world weary, still there's still darkness in there. Um, you hear the occasional crowd chants. You don't know quite what the crowds are chanting about or for uh, in the bridge and in the chorus. Um, samples are generally kind of relegated to just a the rhythm track in this song. But um, yeah, in the darkness of his lyrics, there is some hope that creeps through in The Last Dance, I feel. It, it sounds like a more forward-looking song. It sounds like a call to kind of shrug off all the poisonous baggage of history and kind of move on. Try and find something, try and find something new, try and find a new way of existing. It's a real pop song. That's, that's the real, that's the real turn up, I believe here. It showed that they had a real love and a real feel for pop music and that they whilst they were kind of indulging in this experimental kind of retooling of the whole band um they still love pop music and that comes through in this song despite all the lyrics it feels joy joyous it feels hopeful it's lovely it's a really good song so on onto the the fourth ep um which was the second language ep released in may of 1994 um, rather than the title track, I'd rather talk about the track at the end of the line on this EP. And wow. Wow. This just opens with this burst of echo delayed guitar. Very, very reminiscent of Vinnie Riley of the Durati column. Just beautiful. Just amazing. Which becomes slowly coloured by these kind of burbling synth-like lines. But the, the line kind of bounces back off this kind of tumbling guitar melody. And noise gradually overwhelms the song. It's sound, what sounds like a voice of someone screaming as they're, as they're descending into this bottomless dark pit. Um, and the kind of the sampled noises, they, they just rise and echo and kind of overwhelm the song melting into this kind of beautiful guitar riff. Ah, it's an incredible song. It's an incredible piece of music. It might well be the absolute pinnacle um, to me. Um, and as well, I think here, this is just my observation, there's definite echoes of their former kind of friends, Bark Psychosis. If you remember, I talked about them at the start of this video. Um, Bark Psychosis released an EP in 1991 called Man Man. And if this song has a kind of a sonic cousin, if you like, it would be the track Blood Rush from that EP. Again, just just a beautiful, beautiful sound. And I think at the end of the line, just just 
is the kind of absolute synthesis of their meshing of their traditional guitar kind of chops, their traditional guitar sounds with the technology in just an amazing organic way. I really, you should hear this song. And finally, um, from the last EP, uh, It's a Kid's World, uh, released in September 94. And this is the title track. And um, like the album released around about this time, 93, 94, called D.I. Go Pop, this is D.I. Going Pop. Not pop in the sense, but going pop. They use children's TV music samples which kind of collide and kind of bounce off each other, all kind of held down by, rather cheekily, the drumbeat from Iggy Pop's Lust for Life, just slowed down a little. These little kind of fragmented um, guitar lines are kind of shooting off Krause's um, delayed, kind of echoed guitar lines. Um, it shouldn't work. It really shouldn't work, but it does. It is supremely poppy, it's playful in a way that maybe some of their other material wasn't. And I think it's a sign of where their final album, te um, Technicolor, would would lead them. Um, and in fact, this song is kind of, I think it points towards a kind of a, a future pop music that they wouldn't really see. Because they were clearly trying to kind of weave a bit of a narrative using the samples. They weren't just kind of responding to the samples with words anymore. They were they were trying to tell a story. If you think of like a, a song from many years later, well, I don't know, four or five years later. I'm trying to remember exactly, but I can't. Um, the band The Avalanches, they released a song called Frontier Psychiatrist. This crazy kind of sample driven kind of narrative song. I think I think that kind of music has an incredible debt to where Disco Inferno were at this time and what they were doing, what they were trying to do. So the the band they they split the following year. They they did a few more gigs and uh, and things, but yeah, they split sometime in '95, such that their their final album Technicolor was actually released posthumously the following year in 1996. But summing up, um, I don't really have a problem with including this in my 90s countdown. I know it was released in 2011, but those EPs had been out of print since their original issue for years. And 2011 is 11 years ago now. Um, I'd hate to think that music like this can kind of fall out of the public consciousness, you know, twice within its lifetime. So, yeah, I wanted to talk about this because it's great music. It's kind of, it's brave. It's kind of ragged in places, but it's inspirational. The experimentation that they were involved in yielded hugely different results. And sometimes the music was challenging and sometimes it was just this kind of strange pop music that no one had ever thought of yet. Um, it's a great collection of EPs, it really is, and I think Disco Inverno were a great band. So, the end of another episode, um, please interact as freely as you would like to, via any of the uh, options I've presented below. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed this episode, um, please come back for another episode of 90s overlooked under hood. Thanks. <laughs>